So we'll call the select board meeting for Wednesday, January 19th, 2022 to order. And attendance is David Phil, Jane Nevinsmith, Joyce Chunglo, John Muskevitz, and Amy Parsons. All votes will be taken via roll call and uh, this meeting is being recorded. So first on the agenda, we'll, we'll skip the town administrative report for now. We'll go to consent agenda. Uh, we have warrants AP2228S, AP2228, AP2228V, AP2229S, minutes from January 5th, 2022, uh, 2022 mileage rate approval of 58 and a half cents per mile. So moved. Second. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any discussion on any of those items? Uh, Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungaloo. Yes. Wiskevitz and Parsons. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll do public comments. Uh, please limit your comments. We'll limit this to 15 minutes and please keep your comments to three minutes um, each or less so that everyone has a chance. If anyone's here for public comments, turn on your camera, wave at us or uh, raise that digital hand. All right, last call for public comments. All right, keep going. All right, uh, new business 5.1, human resource manager, resources manager. Uh, Carolyn, do you wanna go ahead with this? Sure. Um, as you know, uh, when uh, we, re uh, we recruited uh, a consultant, we had Deb Radway who came, he returned back when we had a vacancy for our HR director position. Uh, Deb was very clear she was just coming back as a consultant, very, very limited time, and also was gonna get us through a couple things which she's still working on. But in the meantime, um, she prepared a draft uh, job description that I've included. And um, so you can take a look at that. We are, because that position doesn't supervise anyone, uh, we did, uh, put it as an HR manager position, which is real common in a smaller town versus an HR director. We still want to keep it at full time. Uh, and Excuse me for a second. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks. 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 John, if you mute your computer and just listen through the phone, you need to turn the volume off on one or the other to make the feedback go away, okay? Okay, and so we would like to move forward with advertising that position, and I'm confident that Deb will stay on to help with some of the mentoring and some of the, you know, the training and uh, familiarity with Hadley. Uh, so I would like to pursue that. So I, I want authorization, I'm requesting authorization to pursue that, it's, uh, to advertise for that position. Um, and as well as a, a screening committee, um, I, I do think it's helpful, and I, and I don't know if this is what's typical here, but um, my recommendation would be, would be to have um, one committee do the, uh, the complete process and that committee recommending two to three candidates for the full select board to interview together at a meeting. Um, I think that's the most helpful um, to narrow it down for the the select board to interview those people and you would you would all be doing it instead of having just one person do it so that would be my recommendation so i guess the first thing is if you could um take a vote to give me authorization to uh post for that position as well as keeping deb um it, with some overlap and we'll know better about our timeline uh once we get that posted and get some candidates so moved second okay motion by joyce second by jane any discussion on that? Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. Thank you. Parsons? Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn, do we need to approve the job description too, or? If you'd like to, sure. 
Well, if we don't need to. <laughs> it's um, it's it's had just some minor changes. Um, as you know, we we want to have that be a support position as well. Um, so I did uh, we did update it and get some more responsibilities that were under the benefits coordinator, um, such as payroll. And that's really where that position needs the most help is payroll and workman's comp. So I did add that to the position. All right, well, why don't we get a motion just to approve the updated job descriptions, just in case. Motion to approve job description. Second. All right, motion by Jane, second by Joyce. Any discussion on that? Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call field? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalu? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Okay, and so the, the committee, my committee suggestions, member suggestions would be, um, which would cover the whole thing, like I said, the screening, the interviewing, the recommendations to the select board, would be myself, Deb Ratway, Joan, uh, both of our chiefs, chief of police and um, chief of fire, uh, Linda Sanderson and Susan Glowatsky. That would be my recommendation. So moved. Second. All right, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any discussion on that? All right, and then, then it'll come back to the full select board and we'll interview them on camera, just kind of like we did the, the final cut for, for your position. Okay. All right, Jennifer, roll call. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Ch uh, Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right, anything else on that one, Carolyn? All right. Hey, John, your uh, your video and audio is much better on your phone than it is on your computer normally. I can actually hear you. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to bring this computer back to Jennifer tomorrow. So okay. it was good for a couple of months and now it's totally failed again. So. All right. So 5.2 COVID-19 leave guidelines. Um, a little bit of background on this. Um, I don't know that we've ever taken a formal vote on this in the past, but what we've, what we've been doing as since COVID started as a town was any time that an employee was a, a close contact, a positive test, whatever, um, we've been doing uh, the 10-day quarantine period with pay. So, you know, if it was uh, five days of work and, and two days of a weekend and then, uh, you know, three days of the following weekend or the following week, I should say, they were paid for basically eight work days. Um, obviously, that uh, the guidelines there have been changing rapidly. Um, so we need to decide how we're going to proceed here as far as paying employees um, for their time and how we'd like people to quarantine. Um, in, my personal opinion is that we should encourage people to test. And so I don't want to discourage people to from testing by telling them that we're not going to give them the time off if they test positive or they'll have to have to use their own sick leave. So I, I kind of like to see the 10 days stick around until the state or until the state says we don't need to quarantine anymore at some point, um, you know, if that ever happens. But um, so I, I think uh, Joan, Joan, are you here? Yep, I am. Good. I just had to unmute myself. Oh, that's okay. You want to tell us what you yeah. have? Well, so I've kind of put up the request because of the fact that the CDC has changed their guidelines. And we have other guidelines that we follow in terms of payments. The first was the um, Families First Coronavirus Act. that, And that was the two weeks. And that was our basis for how we've been doing it. Um, then that expired. And then we have what's called the emergency paid sick leave from the state. The requirements on that are a little less than the um, FFCRA. And some departments have followed those. So that's why we, I wanna have clarity from the town so that we're all on the same page. And I don't know if Jennifer was able to provide you with the sheets that I did up for that. 
Um, and there was a little background as far as what we've been doing. And uh, some departments are following the, the two weeks paid. Uh, some have been doing the EPSL, which is five days paid. And then after that, they've been using sick leave. Um, so I've done up some options for the guidelines using the various um, quarantining guidelines, because those are kind of two different matters, the quarantining and the payment. And so I've got the options on there for each necessity of time of quarantining, which is the five days of uh, if it's a positive test in which we could pay them the first five days 100%. And if they have to quarantine for an additional five days, pay 100% of that, because um, they do up to 10 days. Um, and the same with the next one, if someone tests positive uh, and the employee is not vaccinated, um, they go with basically the same guidelines of isolating for five days. And do we want to, you know, we pay that at 100%. Then they have people exposed, but who have been vaccinated. There's no isolation required, but we have kind of done it. And do we want to continue to say, okay, you know, you've been exposed um, and you really can't test for five days. Do we want them to isolate or do we want them to come to work with a mask? So I've put the, the options there. What do we want to do with that? Um, and then the, the last questionable is really because of the emergency paid sick leave, they have additional items that they address and require that we pay the 40 hours or the 100, uh, I'm sorry, up to five days or the prorated if they work less than 40 or up, up to a maximum of 850. We can do... 100% if someone's making more than $850 a week. So it's not to penalize them. That's up to the board. Yeah. Um, I know, I know guidelines have changed, but I don't know if I'm still comfortable making uh, people that are possibly positive come back and just wear a mask and be in the building with people that are maybe not comfortable with people that are you know, working right next to somebody right. who is positive. So I, right, and that that's why the different options there. Is but people people are going to test positive for at least ninety days after they have a positive test. If they're right. asymptomatic, they can come back to work wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. um, those should be the guidelines that we follow. And we do. I mean, where this is abbreviated for the purposes of deciding as far as the. This is more to determine how are we going to pay that. Okay. Uh, I think it's an end dollar on town wide. What you know, we we want to do as a town. Um, I don't think there's guidelines set forth in any other city or town with what they do. We don't have to follow suit uh, with whatever. If there is uh, COVID money there that pour out for people that are tested positive. Um, mm -hmm. they paid their usual 40 hours a week. Or and I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sure, Carolyn, you could probably correct me on this and let me know. I don't know. No, I don't think this affects what the school department does. I'm assuming uh -huh. they determine their own guidelines. I would uh -huh. assume they're, they're handling okay. it differently. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was actually just wondering, so, um, people that are vaccinated, that are exposed mm -hmm. and could be potentially positive are not asked to quarantine and are allowed to come to work? Under the new CDC guidelines, if it's, if they say if you were exposed to someone who tests positive and you are up to date, you just need to watch for symptoms until 10 days after exposure wear a mask around others for 10 days, test five days after exposure. Yes. But isn't, doesn't the vaccine make you asymptomatic when you get COVID and you can no. still spread it? No, no, not necessarily. No, 
I Not know necessarily for a fact. Or know for a fact. No, I know. I know for a fact because all of our employees in my office are all boosted because we're mandated, and they are testing positive. They have to be um, somewhat asymptomatic. They have to be out for at least five days. At their fifth day, not counting number one is zero. So then five days after the first onset, then they, um, if they are asymptomatic on the fifth day, they may come back to work wearing a mask. Jane, you, were, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure um, how to ask this question, but is the money coming to pay all of this extra sick leave right out of our regular budget, or is that something the state and the federal guidelines are providing extra funds for because of COVID? They're, the only money we can get back is under the Massachusetts Emergency Paid Sick Leave. Um, I am able to go in and request a reimbursement for up to $850 per person. Only one time, so if they're out a second time, that that's not an option, and it is only up to the eight hundred and fifty dollars maximum. That that was my next question. What happens and if we, somebody gets it the second time, vaccinated or not? Then it's then it's back to, okay, are we going to pay? Then I think a second time they need to be using their sick time. Yeah, the only but Joy's the only issue with that is, you know, we've got I'm sure we have some employees that are limited on sick leave. And so that's almost a um, uh, 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 deterrent to for them to seek testing if they're yeah. sick and also to, and maybe not, to not be forthcoming about a positive test if they, uh, you know, they do test positive that second time. And, and it's a fact that it's in the wastewater and the wastewater employees and the DPW workers are working around that wastewater plant on a daily basis. Where it doesn't seem right there. Yeah. Um, the other issue too is for, we have a lot of employees who are part-time and therefore not benefited who do not have sick leave and depend on whatever pennies they get from us. So they honestly can't afford to go unpaid if they have to be out. I'd like and if we're mandating that they be out, I think it's only fair that we pay it. I'd like to see I that. absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah. I'd and like we to... can apply for refunds on those people too. I'd like I... to see us just pay up to the 10 days, you know, um, if someone needs the full 10 days part-time or, you know, part-time obviously prorate it to what their hours would normally be. Uh, but full-time employees, if, if they're positive, let's pay them. Cause I, you know, I don't want them coming to work sick because they don't want to lose pay or, or they don't want to burn their last little bit of sick leave. They might need to take care of their kids or do whatever, you know? I would rather them be honest about it than not be honest. Yeah. And, and I don't see any widespread abuse of this at this point. I mean, people seem to want to be at work. What What did we, where are we with somebody who gets it a second time? We're still going to pay them, I trust. Highly unlikely they'll get a second time, but that's to be determined, I imagine. Well, I know I've heard that there are people who have gotten it two times in our employment. I would say pay them. You know, it's not their fault. But I'm sure they didn't ask for it. So it's, you know. Well, it depends. Where they, I mean, you can go into you can go into a whole realm of whatever about people getting it twice, getting it, not getting twice. Were they vaccinated? Were they not vaccinated? Did they get vaccinated? And then they got it. So, I mean, there's a whole realm of different things. So I'm going to make a motion that we pay our employees when they're out of work with a COVID exposure or COVID symptoms so that nobody is going to go without any pay. For positive tests, yes. Yes. I'll, I'll agree, I'll second that. All right, motion by Joyce, second by John. Anything else on that? And uh, Joan, before we vote, is that enough? That, that guidance right there, is that enough for you guys? Right, so that even includes the third 
item which had no isolation required under CDC or EPSL, but we are going to, if they're exposed to, to someone who has tested positive, a close exposure, not just, yeah, the guy that lives next door, but someone they live with. Correct. Have been in close contact with um, for an extended period of time, you know, within six feet and sat there for half an hour having coffee with them. <laughs> they would they would fall under the isolate for five days. Correct. Regardless of vaccine status. Right. Yeah. Correct. Although I think we need to take away these 30 minute coffee breaks if they're spreading that much COVID. <laughs> <laughs> The they only, should not. The only thing I wonder about is I know I'm a, well, mine was over a weekend, so I guess it ended up being five days that I had negative, but I was out a Thursday and then Friday, out sick, Friday holiday, Monday test, Tuesday back. So it was five days. So and so, that. so we may get a portion of this back. We may not. Um, we have gotten some money back already. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah. We're, we're putting in the request as quick as we can. <laughs> Okay. Before they run out of money, that's until they run out of the seventy-five million or put more money into the pool. Yeah. So. Uh, I say take care of the employees. They've been sticking with us through all of this and and working as as best they okay. can. So, Great. Uh, Thank you. A anybody else? Any discussion before we vote? Jennifer. Roll call. Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalu. Yes. Muscovitz. Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Okay. All right. And we can, I guess, revisit this if, uh, you know, at some point they say we don't need to quarantine or something along those lines. We'll take take another look. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. All right. Um, 5.3 Unified Command Town Building Recommendations. I see Chief Spanknables here. So, Chief, you want to talk about Unified Command? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, just so you know, we do have another emergency going on right now. So I'll read this and unfortunately I'm gonna have to leave. Um, as everybody knows, it's been very cold lately and we've been having a lot of freeze ups. Uh, so if folks could keep an eye on their pipes and everything, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, so the it was requested by the select board uh, for un the unified command team to get to back together. Uh, to review and provide the select board with a recommendation on senior center vaccination card mandate and also if the select board should consider the closing of town buildings. Um, so we met twice, the unified command team was put together twice uh, and due to scheduling, we decided to do twice to make sure everybody was at the table. Uh, the first meeting included the town administrator, the select board chair, police chief, fire chief and EMD and the senior center director. Uh, we had an open discussion of the concerns for both for and against the mandate and other options. We reviewed current CDC guidance and information, and it was felt that it was crucial, above all, to continue with senior center and town building operations, especially the senior center and library with the current weather conditions that we have. The operations of the senior center and library are a critical resource, and we felt that this should not be limited to anyone as a result of not having a vaccination card. Director Wood did state that the senior center had decided to scale back on group sizes and suspend in-person dinners until further notice. And we discussed, discussed some other options uh, for limiting uh, group size. Um, in an effort to provide employees and visitors with additional options of protection, we discussed face coverings as there were some questions about that. Uh, the use of KN or N95 masks along with surgical masks. We reviewed CDC guidance and while they feel that any face covering is better than none, we felt that we should provide our employees and visitors with an option of additional protection if they so choose. Uh, I will be putting together, and I've already started handing out appropriate uh, listed KN95 masks uh, and distributing it to all of our departments so that a, a town employee can make that decision if they wanna make it, if they, if they wanna wear it. And we will also provide uh, some masks, so what we have uh, in stock to make sure that we still have access for public safety. Uh, we will have masks available uh, to the public at the Senior Center Library and Town Hall for folks to grab if they feel they want the added protection of a N9, KN95 or an additional surgical mask. 
<clears throat> excuse me. The second meeting included the same group and also added Dr. Mosler to the Board of Health. And we reviewed our previous meeting with her and what we felt was reasonable recommendation to the select board. We discussed concerns of how we, we could enforce such a mandate if we went down this road and Chief Mason felt the town council should be involved if we were to require this mandate uh, for vaccine cards and how we were to handle incidents where visitors refused to comply with providing a vaccine card. Uh, the group's recommendation to the select board is that the select board not institute required vaccine mandate at the senior center and that we continue with our current best practice approach of mass mandates in all buildings along with social distancing and promoting that if you don't feel well to stay at home. We also recommend that the town buildings not be closed at this time, especially the senior center and library in order that they can continue to serve our most vulnerable populations. We'll continue to monitor and it was felt that if we need to revisit this in uh, next month, we will. However, if the vaccine mandate is put forward for review again, uh, we feel that legal counsel needs to become a part of our unified command to provide guidance on how to handle anyone refusing to provide a card uh, for their vaccination status. Chief, just to clarify one point, just so it's not a miscommunication, the masks that we're providing to the public are for patrons of the senior center and library, not um, just handing them out for people to take home. Uh, That's correct. Uh, the department heads were advised to just limit, you know, one per person is for their visit. Okay. So that's that's the recommendation there. Um, we probably don't, do we need a vote on that? Or is that just a, a policy that we just move forward with? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm make a motion to accept the recommendation of the command uh, okay. unit committee. I'll second it. Okay, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any other discussion on this? Uh, oh, um, I'll just mention testing. We talked about testing a little bit at the end of the meeting, um, the, the second meeting. Um, well, Jane probably knows about this more, more than I do, but there's some difficulty getting tests uh, for, for testing centers at this point. So um, I, I think Dr. Moser said they ordered 250 tests and they only got a portion of, of that uh, that they requested because the, the state is short or whoever they're getting it from is a little bit short. So um, I know UMass still has pickup tests available for free where you can go there, pick up a test, do your swab at home and drop it in a box later on. Um, and I, Jane, the testing at the senior center is continuing, correct? That's continuing, yes. And so far we have enough tests. It's by appointment. Also, I would point out that the federal government's home test opened, their website opened last night actually, uh, and people can click on a link and get four tests sent to their home address at no cost. Okay. Uh, is, that, is that per person, per household, Jane, do you know? It's per address because I tried to get two sets for us and they said, no, we're already sending to that address. Well, I mean, there's some big families in town, you know. I hear you. That's their rule. Okay. I just but, wasn't clear uh, on it. John, I can tell you that UMass, because we have five in our family and they only give you four tests at a time, uh, they said there's no issue with going there, uh, you know, two people dropping by and getting four tests each or going, you know, every day you can go there and pick up tests if you want. So if you have a big family and you can't get enough, that's an option. So, All right. Uh, Jennifer, roll call. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right. And uh, I was going to say thanks, Chief, but he's already on the way to his emergency, so he's already gone. Um, 5.4, Special Police Officer, Hadley Police Department. Chief Mason, do you want to talk about this? Yep, I will be brief. Um, this shouldn't take too long. Um, it is a simple pay increase request for our special police officers. Um, I'm sure by now everybody knows the difficulty in locating qualified police candidates out there with uh, a lot of the changes with the reform. Um, one of the, uh, the points that we are going to be attacking, hopefully, as we move forward with police negotiations is to try to make sure that our uh, salaries are competitive 
one of the places that they are not remotely competitive is with our special police officers. And unfortunately, these are the folks that we are trying to get to hang around until we can fill the vacancies that we have. The MPTC has not allowed us to fill the two vacancies we have with the people that we have on the roster because they don't have the adequate amount of uh, time on the job. So we'll be sending them to the police academy in June. Carolyn has uh, offered, given them conditional offers of employment, but we'd like for them to stick around until then and not get sucked up by some other police department who pays a heck of a lot more than this. So right now they're making $15 and 83 cents an hour. I would like to make a re- an official request to uh, increase that pay to $21 an hour. Um, It's slightly below what the step one for part-time officers uh, within the union make. So we just wanted to make sure that it was a little bit below that. So we didn't have to deal with any issues of complaint from that aspect. Uh, I did run it through human resources and they agree that the wage now is is way too low and $21 is competitive for this for this duty that they perform. Um, You know, we're going to be using these folks a lot more in the near future. We have two, as I mentioned, we have two vacancies. Um, We have one officer in the academy. So that brings us up to three wide open positions that we're going to be paying overtime or using these folks um, to get to fill those shifts. I got one officer who just sustained a pretty, a a minor injury. He's going to be out for probably a couple of weeks. And just like everybody else, we are ducking and dodging COVID left and right. Um, Just had another officer test positive the other day. So he's out for his five days unless, you know, unless he has symptoms. So, you know, the hits just keep coming, but we have these holes all over the place and we're trying to fill them with these folks as opposed to overworking our officers and paying overtime for it. So simple request is to increase the rate of pay uh, for the special police officers to $21 an hour. Motion to accept that at $1 for a special officers. Second. Second. Oh, too slow, Amy. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. And uh, Chief, is this something that your your budget can uh, can can cover for this uh, this thrust this year? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the two vague, it, it, I'm not going to be able to, within the line for part-time officers, we will go in the negative, but we were going to go into the negative anyways because of what's happening right now. However, our bottom line, we will not be in the negative. We will be fine because I have the two salaries of the two officers that left the two full-time officers who quit to go to other departments. I still have those salaries that can be shifted to, uh, to cover these expenses. So yes, the answer, the, the short answer is yes. The long answer is we have to do some moving around, but we'll be fine. Okay. Any other discussion? No. Jennifer? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That seems so bizarre because you can start at the gas station Pride at $17 an hour. Yeah. uh, You know, the the reasons that we just haven't adjusted that in such a long time is because (laughs) You, you know, staffing changes so quickly with, especially lately that they don't stay in that, at that level for very long. We usually suck them up to the full-time ranks so quickly. So we've just never really messed with it. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it was time for. Yeah. And then we had those other men with reform about us, not specials and going for full-time employees and things. So had a couple of curveballs in there all together, and then you put that COVID business on top of it. And, uh, you know, whether or not we have the money, we got to pay it. If we have to reimburse uh, through the COVID thing, like Joan was talking about, then we could do that too. But if we can keep it within your budget, that's great too. If not, we'll, we'll find money for it. Yeah, I got I got three three young folks. Matter of fact, one of them is at the emergency that the fire chief was talking about right now. Three young folks who really like like working here. They like the town. Um, they, they are super appreciative of the fact that Carolyn gave them the conditional offer, but I just want to make sure we got the hooks in them so they don't disappear and go, you know, work in East Hampton for $7 an hour more an hour. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Okay. All right. Thanks chief. 
All right, next on the list is 5.5, Nightly Road Culvert Emergency Authorization. Uh, Select Board will discuss the Nightly Road Culvert and Emergency Authorization for Repairs. Uh, Chris is here from the DPW and Carolyn, who wants to start with this and where, where we are and how we got here? Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank, you. thank you for having me. Mr. Chairman, um, we, um, we finally got a, uh, as, as you are aware, a nightly road issue has, has been, it has taken us too long. We had them um, condition, a condition from conservation to take care of the, not war, head war, but in the course of the duration before we got to where we are now, the south end of the order, the war is also an, having issues. So we decided that um, while we take care of, it's better to take care of both walls before it's gonna cost us less. And then we finally got a contractor that would do both. And so we also discussing with our consultant who, um, our engineering consultants, and he also talking with conservation. But at the because of the weather, we had uh, fro um, a lot of um, because of the winter cold weather. The stream, uh, in our view, uh, was uh, was not flowing as such that we cannot consider it a low flow. Uh, talking to many, and so we thought that uh, we'll be able to go ahead. Uh, and then on Friday we had a pre-construction meeting the last Friday, which on the 14th. We had the conservation chair at the meeting. We also had uh, the contractor representative there. Uh, Scott McCarthy and myself, we had the meeting. Our consultant from was also at the meeting, our engineering consultant from Comprehensive Environmental. So the discussion was to see if Conservation will. What can we, what will be the next step? Would they allow us to uh, request for amendment, or we should go ahead? Or can the chair give us an emergency authorization? The chair of conservation, but uh, he he wasn't ready to do that. And the suggestion that came up was that either they may cancel the current um, approval they've given to us. Or we may have to refile. But the but our consultant speaking to thought that even if we have to do something, it might be an amendment. Or because of the the road, the road is failing ar 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 around the culvert, that uh, we we think that conservation should be able to. But um, we left that meeting um, with that conservation signing off. They, and so they are requesting that we come before them the next meeting, which is February 8th. And um, meanwhile, our consultant is been in consultation with um, the, sec the, the clerical staff of conservation. And so we, we looked at the road and one of the things that came up was the option that we felt we should bring before the select board. Um, if we go with the route with the conservation is thinking, we may not fix this problem before some summertime. And we think is uh, the road is, fa is, is failing. And so we are uh, making recommend, uh, recommendation or suggesting that if the select board can take a look and declare it an emergency so that it can give us a legal standing to fix the road while we also pursue um, whatever um, paperwork and other amendments that conservation may request from us. The road is, um, the, 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 the head walls are failing. We, the culvert itself is stable, but the road around the area is also failing. And so we don't know, in my view, and in our view of public works, we don't think we have too much, otherwise, it, the expenditure is going to be uh, costly. So that's why we are here before the select board, Mr. Chairman. 
Okay, thank you. So we're looking to deem this uh, the north and south headwall repairs in the area as an emergency Jenga. Um, as liaison to uh, conservation, I was in on a discussion of this. They were very concerned that all the materials for this job were put on site without any conversation about the fact that they were going to do both sides of the culvert. There's been ample time if you knew you were going to order that stuff for that to come in. I think the town has to be really careful to not not follow conservation as a town when we require that individuals follow conservation. And I don't want to set a precedent. If the road really is that dangerous, then you close down at the culvert and traffic goes either way and it's a long way around and it's happened to other areas in town. And we keep dragging our feet. It's been two years. We haven't fixed the north side because of the, the uh, Conservation Commission ruling regulating us to death and paperwork. Now the south side has failed and we're running into the same trouble there. What are, I'm sick of closing roads and costing us hundreds of thousands of dollars. I just deem it an emergency and fix it and let's move on. Why this did we ridiculous. wait two years to fix it after the first approval for the north side? Well, we, the Conservation Commission only approved one side. So Why didn't we do that side when it was approved? Why have we waited two years? Ask, ask your DPW. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't two years, Mr. Chairman. It was approved last year and last summer. It wasn't got, two years. We and got that, was that. that over two years ago. They, we Over two years ago, we had the issue. We approached conservation to declare the emergency for us to fix. We even requested that we should, we had the the part of the headwater that fell into the brook. We requested that she allow us to pick it up, but we were not allowed. Uh, it was, it wasn't, there was nothing two years ago that was approved. So it was, they had to make us to go through conservation uh, process. We reminded them that uh, at that time, um, we, we should be able to uh, uh, fix, even if it's temporary. Again, the, we, we requested many times, they refused and they got back to us. So the process of approval was done last summer. And we weren't, and they gave us some conditions. And some of the conditions they gave us also was gonna cost us money to put it together including um, redirecting the flow, including making sure that we have to do it at low flow. And if you look at last year, if last year is um, a guide, uh, we had a, a lot of rain and water in, in the summer. We don't know how this summer, coming summer is gonna look like. But in this December, because of COVID, it was difficult also for us to get contractors to give us bid for, this, for the job. So that also created a problem. Well, we need to now declare a state of emergency, get it done, have a conversation, have an appointment with the Conservation Commission, and do what we need to do to just do it. Um, let's not talk about it anymore. Let's just do it, call conservation. I would like to make a motion for us to, I'm declaring an emergency to get that fixed. And I want us uh, appointing Carolyn or David Phil is our chair to contact the Conservation Commission and see what we need to do with them, uh, whether we have to get on their agenda for the February meeting um, or if they will come to our meeting and tell us what we need to do. So either way, um, that was that's my motion. No second on that, right? Yes, get it done, second. All right. Um, and real quick, I, I'd rather Carolyn uh, keep contact in contact with them because she's had a kind of an overview of what's going on with this project. So, be yeah, I'll, I'll let her take that. And just C Carolyn, just to be clear, the this is going to go back to conservation. We're not just proceeding mm -hmm. and starting work tomorrow. It's got to go back on their February something meeting, right? February 8th. February 8th. OK. So even if we say it's a it's an emergency, they still have to approve it. Let me can I, let, let me get some more information about that. 
Okay. But okay. we're not going to stick a shovel in the ground tomorrow without finding out what's correct when we're there. Yeah. That's so. Going to do it right. Yep. We don't need another Moody Bridge. No. Issue. So. <clears throat> No, you know, and you got a lot of people living on that road. You got farmers that are going to use that road all year long. We can't close that road. You're, you're going to have quite an uproar from all the farms up in that area if you close that road down. You well, know, we had, you know, I, I agree with Chris. We had so much rain last year with all the restriction they put on us. We couldn't get it done. But the point is now the north side failed and now the south side's failing. So, you know, it's it's just getting worse by the day here. Not any better. Yep. Motion on the table. All right. Nothing else. Well, is there anything else before I ask for a roll call? Okay. Jennifer, please. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chunglo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Carolyn, Town Administrator Report. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know, um, la the last select board meeting, you had asked to put the water and sewer rate discussions and fees for water and sewer. Um, it's not on the agenda tonight, and I wanted to explain that to the public as well, because you had asked about that, uh, because I wanted to get more input from those departments and an accurate analysis of the history, um, where we're at right now with expenses and revenues and then for, and then forecasting ahead with usage and other expenses. I, I really don't feel like I had enough information to bring to the select board to start those discussions. So I just wanted to explain why that wasn't on the agenda, um, but we will be um, working towards that to give you a date um, to move forward with that and any hearings that would need to take place. The, um, hey, Caroline. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Um, the big issue was the $10 fee we put on the bill for the non-sewer customers because I, I'm, going, I'm running for re-election and I'm speaking to more and more people all the time. And that's one of the big issues that everybody's having is that fee and, that and we I, put on yeah. for everyone. And I appreciate that, John. And that's exactly why I wanted to have a better um, explanation of what that fee goes to, to make sure it's understood where that fee goes to. And discussions on that would impact as we move forward with fees. And so I, I do think I need to do both of those things together. Yes. Because, because when we figured it, when Sue figured it, it was only a matter of $28,000, which we thought was really not a lot, but it, 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 it is impacting everyone that is not on sewer. Yeah, and respectfully, John, I'd, I'd like to wait for any more further discussion if it's to post it on as an agenda item. But I, I want to just have the most information for you. And that's why I really wanted to make that uh, clear today, why it wasn't on there. It wasn't an oversight. Thank you for doing that, Carolyn. Sure. Um, just uh, some dates to remember. Uh, warrant articles are due um, on February 16th, and we'll, we'll be hoping to close the warrant on February 16th. Annual reports are due to Jennifer on February 18th, and we still need nominations for the annual report and for the Fred Oakley Award. Uh, we started budget reviews uh, last week and this week, and we'll continue until next week. Um, and we're moving along with that to prepare to present the budget to the Finance Committee and your board. Uh, let's see, the reminder that the last day to obtain nomination papers for town election is March 25th, and the last day to submit nomination papers to the registrars for certification is March 29th. So I just wanted to get those dates out as a reminder, and that's all I have for tonight. Let's do uh, announcements because uh, all we have left is the exec executive session. I have two announcements for this evening. Um, we have a, the passing of Ernest Gallo, husband of Nadine. Um, so condolences to their family. Rosalie Michalunas, um, she's not a Hadley resident, but uh, she has uh, family here in Hadley. Her maiden name was Vasallo. She's John. And I believe she's Joanne Keller's aunt. Um, so certainly condolences to her family. And those are my two. 
I want to give thanks to public safety. They, they, I don't know if everyone knows it was in the paper, but um, there have been water leaks over at the um, housing groups over at Greenleaves Drive. And they had to relocate everything. And the senior center has been working really hard, but public safety has done a heroic job over there. And they just deserve a shout out. So, so my question, Jane, to you, is that part of the, uh, is Wingate the owners of the property uh, responsible for those water bursts? I don't yeah. want to make a legal statement, but it appears that it was inside the building. So oh, it was inside, inside the building. Yeah, I, I, I believe they are responsible for it, Joyce. It has happened before when they first built the first one. And I know they there was quite some complications at the time to get somebody in there to get the work done, you know. Okay. I think yeah. our not not a town water line issue. No. Yeah. yeah. No. No, it's not, it's not a town issue, but public safety's involved because they got to move the people and get the people out and keep the building safe and on and on and on. And it's actually in the senior housing and it was at night, so they had to move seniors at night. Luckily, there were hotel room available. Now they have to move them to different rooms because those hotels are booked for the weekend, uh, yeah. getting seniors back in to get clothes and medicines and things they didn't take the first time. It's, they're just doing a great job. Yeah, and I, and I think people need to know this, that is not the job of our fire safety people um, to do these things, but they are and, a wonderful group of people. And there are there are employees, and but they're not responsible for um, doing these kind of things. But they do because that's who they are. So you know, thanking and, them also. And, and police, Joyce. And police, our fire, public safety, absolutely. They go above and beyond all the time. We have to give Tommy kudos as well. <laughs> yeah, he was in all of those. Yeah, and it was it's, yeah. it's been a total of three, but it looks sounds like it's wrap four now but all of them have needed to be locations. Absolutely. We have, we have a great town. That's the bottom line. And we have a lot of hotel rooms. Yep. <laughs> yes, that's true. Any other announcements? Nope. All right. So we have uh, two executive session issues tonight. And so I will read both of them. And then we'll get a, a motion and roll call vote on them since uh, we will not be reconvening in, in uh, open session. So 8.1 is the select board will enter into executive session as per the provisions of MGL chapter 30A, section 21A1 um, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. And 8.2 on the agenda is the select board will enter into executive session per MGL chapter 30A, section 21A3 to discuss litigation regarding the matter of Hieronymus Peter versus Town of Hadley, where discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect on the town's litigation position and the chair so declares. So move to go into executive session for those reasons, not to convene in open session. And that was, was that a second from you, Amy? Yes. Okay. So motion by Joyce, second by Amy. Uh, let's see. As chair of the Hadley Select Board, I state that the board has moved and seconded uh, to enter into executive session, and that I state that discussing the matters in open session will have an adverse effect on the town of Hadley. Roll call vote, please. Roll call vote, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. Wiskevitz. Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody.